thanks very much, everybody, for uh, for coming by and for for staying late. Certainly recognize that I am between you and hopefully a frosty adult beverage of your choice. Uh, the only thing that's critically important is we ask that you drink real beer, and that does not include junk American lagers because that's not real. Make an American craft beer. Spend your money where it belongs. I'll, that's the end of the soapbox that I'll get on that. So I'm here to talk about package management databases, which is precisely what you want to be here on day two. I think it's Thursday, right? Day two, 8 p.m., this is what you want to be here for. Well, I'm actually really excited that you're here. This is actually a subject that I tripped over during a case uh, some time ago, and I threw a note in my, my, my kind of to-do list that never gets done, and I said, man, i got to write something about this because it was a really cool find. It was kind of a eureka moment, and anytime I have one of those eureka moments on a case, I'm like, I really like to share that. And uh, and it just was there and there, and I'm like, yeah, I'll get to it, yeah, I'll get to it. And then Rob shot me an email, and he's like, yeah, um, by the way, you're doing it at night uh, on this date at this time. I'm like, okay, I mean, he could have asked. I would have said yes, but when Rob says I'm going to give a talk, I'll give a talk. That's cool. Um, and I kind of happen to look at the list at the same time, and I'm like, perfect. You know, that's an ideal moment, so I'm really glad to be able to finally have the, the kind of push in the right direction to put this out there. I hope that it's something that's very useful. Um, as I said, it's something that grew out of a real case requirement. So, you know, I put together some of the commands that I use in this type of situation, and uh, and I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are. If it's something that you uh, you may be able to use. So, why are we here? Well, plain and simple, we're here to talk about how these package management databases can be used to our advantage in a forensic context. And I think, I hope, that in providing this information, it's something that you can find actionable right away. If you're working on Linux systems or anything along those lines uh, that have these package management databases, there are really, really easy ways to use system utilities to our advantage. How can we do that to minimize the data we have to be concerned with, that we have to look at, etc. So who the heck am I and why do I deserve to be up here? Because it's a very fortunate thing that I'm up here. I certainly don't take that lightly. Well, uh, my name is Phil Hagen. I've been a, a forensic and information security consultant for about four years now. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, originally in the Air Force communications officer. Um, I had gotten out and done uh, defense contractor, IC contractor, and LE work, uh, mostly in and around DC, a couple other places. Uh, most recently, I've been uh, fortunate enough to be course lead for the new Forensic 572 course, uh, which is our network forensic course. It's gone really well. This is our inaugural event for the, the non-beta course, and uh, so far the feedback that we've received has been really good. Certainly aiming to continue that trend for the week. Now why do I know Linux stuff? Well, back at the Air Force Academy, sorry if this is a repeat for the folks that are in my class, uh, we had a blazing T1 for the entire campus, about 5,000 people on campus, 4,000 students, 1,000 uh, faculty. And uh, I would stay up till the middle of the night so I could be the one that absolutely monopolized that T1 to download Slackware and every single thinking floppy that it came on. Didn't actually put it on floppies, but that was the first exposure that I had to Linux. To that end, I had a SCSI drive connected to a card that had a controller chip that was not supported by the default Linux kernel. So if you've ever had to bootstrap, compile a Linux kernel in order to support hardware that wasn't built into it, it's trial by fire in, I don't know, some other horrible example. I can't even think of an analogy off the top of my head. It's really not fun. That said, it teaches you the, the real, real Linux admin kind of, you know, cut your teeth, get off my lawn. I've, I, I, earned that, uh, <laughs> I earned that after so many nights of fighting. Um, you know, so that's gonna, been the kind of environment that I've been working in ever since. That was back somewhere around 94, which I realized was not quite the dawn of Linux. Um, but it's been something that has been a part of my daily operation ever since, and that's been in a variety of different capacities, from an administrative capacity, hobbyist capacity. Um, I do run a small-scale web and email host on the side, which I started in the Air Force because they weren't giving me any technical opportunities at the time, and I'm like, if I don't stay current, I'm going to atrophy into a manager, and I don't think I want to do that. So I said, i got to get a keyboard in here that's not connected to PowerPoint or Excel. So anyway, that's the, uh, the exposure that I've had, and certainly more recently from a forensic perspective, investigating Linux and Unix-like systems has given me a, a newfound perspective on uh, what those operating systems can provide. 
one of the big selling points behind Linux is, hey, it is open source and it exists in this beautiful open source community where you can do anything you want. Wow, that's pretty cool. I can download the source code, the recipe, the, the, just the essence of this software and I can compile it to my whim and I can install it and that's awesome. But what if I need to do that on a thousand systems or 10,000 systems? or a giant cluster of who knows what. Fantastically different problem. Because I'm not going to SSH. I love SSH, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to SSH onto those thousand systems, even through an automated script, to run dot slash configure, ampersand, ampersand, make, ampersand, ampersand, make install, ampersand, ampersand, check config, ampersand, ampersand, service. I'm not going to do all that, because that is a ridiculous way to manage software. It is not scalable. It also doesn't do things like dependencies. Oh, you don't have libpcap version 1.2.3 point blah, 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 subset, blah, this other thing. I'm going to fail now. Well, now you've got to go chase that down. Well, let me install it. Well, that certainly was not uh, the kind of thing that you could do. So enter package management to the rescue. It does all that cool stuff for us. The specification of a lot of these has manifests. What is in this package? Which files does this package own? It includes things like upgrading and installation and uninstallation scripts. Hey, you know what? If you install sendmail or if you install postfix, you need to create a user account that it will use to run. And it should have these this name and it should have these parameters set up. So these little scriptlets are able to, uh, to control the way that is, is, uh, uh, is being executed. Similarly, uh, it's going to uh, Excuse me. Uh, it's just going to make our lives significantly easier because I can deploy that package once. I can deploy that package ten times, a hundred times, a thousand times. I have a reasonable degree of certainty that if the package was created correctly, I'm going to have a consistent deployment across my environment. Total score because a consistent environment is a manageable environment. There are a lot of different uh, solutions that we can use that are available on the mass market today that do this. Certainly, we've heard of. of I'll skip down to the bottom. RPM used by the usual Red Hat type flavors, but it is also what I'll say is most important, is a part of the Linux standard base, the LSB. If you're not familiar with that, it's a set of, of framework that says if you want to be LSB compliant, you need to have these types of parameters. You need to have these constraints. You need to use RPM for your package management. You need to use certain directory structures, certain, uh, certain other parameters to, uh, to say that you're compliant. It's not like a law, it's not a rule, of course. It's just saying if you want to be LSB compliant, you're going to give yourself this kind of a benchmark. Now, there's a number of other ones as well. Um, I'm familiar mostly with OPKG or OPackage because it is on my QNAP NAS at home, and it's very common in embedded devices. So whenever you see a lot of our you know, miniaturization into some of these very, very small-scale Socrus-type boxes, um, you know, we have a lot of embedded utilities that need to be uh, that need to be managed. Everybody should be also familiar with dpackage uh, from the Debian Ubuntu community, and Slackware has its favorite tarballs or TGZ files. Now that's cool, but it's still not the end all be all. Has anybody ever managed software strictly through RPM and no other utilities? If you have, you've visited a pleasant place called dependency hell. RPM install this file. Nope, I need this other dependency. Okay, let me jump back out. RPM install that one. Nope, you need these other four. So take a step back. Download, install, download, install, down, or attempt to install. And you do this until the bar opens, and then you go downstairs and you're like, I'm not going to install that software tonight. I'm just going to go downstairs to the bar because that is ridiculous. So some very, very smart people have developed software around that. And they've developed the uh, uh, things like apt-get and aptitude. YUM, which is used in most RPM type installations, as well as Red Hat Network. It's a commercial offering around this kind of a, a Red Hat platform. These are going to manage the dependencies. I'm going to say, you know what? I want TCP dump. YUM install TCP dump. Hey, you know what? You need libpcap for that. Cool. Install that too. And it will say, uh, do you want me to take care of that for you? I say yes. Downloads it, installs it, I'm good to go. So these higher level uh, pieces of software have taken a lot of the headache uh, that remained out of the, the world of RPM. That said, these are so cool. I love them. But we're not going to talk about those quite so much tonight. We're going to talk about the RPM database itself. 
I certainly didn't want to let these valuable utilities go without mention um, because they do still have a couple of uh, interesting artifacts left over. We're going to talk about those in a minute. Um, one of the things that I did see uh, in the same uh, case that I worked that, that inspired this talk, the first thing the bad guys did when they got on the box, yum install nmap. I was like, nah, -uh. no, no, no way. They, no, no bad guys are going to do that. That even Hollywood wouldn't do that. That's stupid. Yep, sure enough, every piece of evidence showed that that is the very first thing they did when they installed. Why? Well, in this case, they wanted to go find some database servers. And the only way they had in their limited toolkit at the time to do that was, oh, I'll just done map for 3306. Go find my MySQL servers. Show me them, give me them, done. So what are we going to talk about in the scope here? We're just going to look at RPM. But most of these concepts I'm going to, I'm going to mention do apply to uh, other package management standards. The most robust of those is going to be the Debian packaging system, the DPKG. Um, there are others. I don't want to, uh, to, to rule them out, but I will say that between RPM and the, uh, the Debian Ubuntu packaging systems, those are, in my mind, the most robust and provide us the most opportunities for forensic artifacts. All the examples that you see here, I tested on CentOS 6.5. When you're doing this kind of work, it is important to consider when I take an image of a system, let's say that's a, a CentOS 6.2 uh, system, I recommend matching your examination or your analysis system to that distribution. And the reason is your versions of RPM itself and the libraries behind it, um, in particular the Berkeley uh, DB libraries, need to match up. Otherwise you will mismatch some, uh, some utilities or mismatch some findings. You may have some success with mismatched versions, but I can tell you right now, haven't had an opportunity to try this on the SIFT 3 workstation, but on the 2.14 workstation, if you install RPM, it's available even though it's the Ubuntu VM, and you try to query a CentOS 6.5 uh, RPM database, it will very happily tell you that it's not going to allow you to do that. And then when you're Phil and you're getting ready to create this talk, and you're like, oh, all right, I'm going to change my approach because that's what we do, right? We have to adapt and overcome. So I can tell you that firsthand. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's not a fun thing to do. I have a bunch of commands that are going to be logged in here. My intent, I will be honest, was noble. Uh, I was planning to have these all ready to post well uh, before this talk, and reality being what it may, didn't have an opportunity to do that. That said, I'm going to get these up as soon as I can. I'm hoping that it's going to be in the next day or so, um, but I will have these posted. I want to make sure that the slides themselves, as well as all the commands, are easily accessible for everybody to use and provide feedback on. So where do we go to get the evidence? This is going to be a familiar theme for uh, folks that are in 572 because I think what's most important for us is to not just say there is evidence out there. We need to find out where it is because if we don't go collect the right evidence, we're certainly going to be selling ourselves short. The majority of what we'll talk about today lives in a Berkeley database that generally sits in the varlib RPM directory. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's default. Almost every installation, probably every installation I've ever seen has used that location. Now these database files contain metadata for every single file that was deployed as a part of an RPM file, as a part of an RPM package. And the metadata is listed here. The user and group ownership for the file, the permissions, Unix file system permissions, if you're not familiar, the uh, uh, user group and other permissions, read, write, execute, there's a few other special bits in there. The MD5 kind of checks some. Everything in the RPM specification says we use MD5 checksums. But guess what's actually there when you query it in, Red Hat, in uh, CentOS 6.5? SHA-256. Totally not documented. The way they tell you to determine whether or not you're looking at an MD5 or a SHA-256 is to measure the length of the string. It's like, yeah, that's robust. Thanks a lot. Why don't you just call it checksum and whatever. We also have the file size available. Um, if it's any uh, entry that is in dev, if you've seen that, uh, the major and minor device numbers are also logged in the database. Um, and if it's a symbolic link, because not only can RPM control files, it can control sim links. If the sim link is a part of the RPM, it manages and tracks the location of the sim link target. Really, really important because if you were to have an attacker who were to change that sim link, I certainly would want to know 
if the symlink I used to have to, oh, I don't know, the SSH binary in user bin went someplace else. Be a very important thing for me. Modification time as well. I've highlighted and, and bolded the ones that are of the most, uh, most likely forensic value to us. And I'll show you those when we do some queries in just a minute. I told you we weren't really going to talk about some of the higher level stuff. This is the exception here. Uh, the yum log is going to tell us when things were updated, installed, and removed through the yum command. That can be very valuable. And there's also a file that is created by default on most CentOS systems that is the var log RPM packages series of files. It gets rotated. That's run every week. Uh, every week no, I'm sorry, every day on the latest versions. And uh, that will say, here is a list of all the packages I had installed on this particular day. It's, uh, it's rerunning that uh, through the cron schedule. So how do we practically access this? Let's say, for sake of argument and the fact that I already put in the slides, let's say that we have created an image, a forensic image of our system, and based on what we learn in 508, we have mounted that file system, forensically sound, read-only, loopback mount, et cetera, et cetera, using a fuse or uh, EW, mount ewf.py. We've mounted that on the mount subject mount point. So you can see here, I ran the command, I said, show me, you know, run the mount command, show me everything that's mounted, just look for subject, and sure enough, I've got my, uh, uh, it's using logical volume management, which is why it shows up under dev mapper for the main uh, partition, and then we've got loop 0p1, which is the boot partition. So I've gone ahead, I've mounted that file system, I can navigate that at will. Just CD off to mount subject, and I'm good to go. Score. So what we do next is we run the dash dash, we run RPM with the dash dash root, option. That tells us for every operation you commit, change over to the mount subject directory in this case. So I'm going to use that as a, a relative directory for my RPMs. I'm going to use that as a relative directory for my files that I'm querying. All of that falls directly in that one location. We should not trust the RPM binary from a suspect system. Now yes, you can validate this. I'm going to show you how to do that. So if you validate that that is still a legitimate copy of RPM, you may be able to do that. But as best practice, I recommend against it. Just because you don't want to get up there, if you're in a, a situation where you have to testify, you don't want to say, oh yeah, I, I checked to make sure everything was cool, and then I used the, uh, the command off the compromised system where the bad guy had administrative access. Let's just do things right the first time around so we don't have to have that really unpleasant discussion with the defense attorney on why they think you're less than an adequate forensicator. Don't blame me for it. If you're on the stand, nobody says Phil Hagen said it was okay because that's bad. Didn't say that. Never do that. Uh, a really important note, though, if you're not familiar with a Chirrut, uh, Chirrut changes your uh, relative root directory for a particular set of operations. Very important to know that this requires administrative access. You will be running some of these commands through sudo, and I'll show you that here. Um, ver validation against the file system requires that access, so just be really careful on that. So there's a couple of use cases that I've got highlighted here um, that I think are very important for us in a forensic environment. First and foremost, dash qf on a file name. Tell me what package owns this. Where did you come from? I'm not going to do Cotton Eye Joe. Just where did you come from? We'll end it there. Everybody will be happier. Nobody has to be mad at me. But it's also going to identify pa files that are not owned by a package, which is certainly a very, very important piece of information because if I want to say, show me what the attacker may have created or the user created or show me what I care about out of that file system, well, this is certainly a good place to start. For example, here, uh, I use RPM double dash root mount subject, so I'm not going to say that with every single command, it's just assumed. Um, I'm going to run this command, which is going to say, tell me which package owns the user sbin sshd binary or file. It's a binary in this case. Note, however, that the path is relative to the original directory structure. We're not talking about querying mount subject user sbin sshd, we're going off the original root. And it's going to quickly and happily report, hey, cool, that's a package called OpenSSH server. Done deal. Well, great. That's owned by something that I would kind of expect it to be. And I've got another example here, in this case, mail.rc. However, SE crypt tab, not owned by a package, it'll tell us that as well. 
So now we're able to say, well, that was created at some point outside the confines of the RPM structure and the RPM hierarchy. So that's all good and well. And I'll show you a couple of cool script uh, subsets in a minute that you utilize that. But another really useful feature is the ability to validate. Let's think back for just a minute to all those pieces of metadata. They're all in a database. Well, tell me what's different. So if I use the dash capital V command, it's going to verify or validate the contents of that package against what is in the database. Score. Tell me what's changed since installation so I can further investigate that. This uh, series of, of characters, the SM5DLUGT, I'm pretty sure if you try to pronounce that, it's illegal in some states. But if you uh, take a look at these, these are the characters that it's going to report. I'll show you in just a minute. For each check that it makes, it's going to tell us which ones fail. It gives us, a, as you see on this, actually, it'll be two slides ahead. It will tell us if it's passed, it'll tell us if it's failed, and it'll also tell us a couple other useful pieces of information. What's important to note is if you see a question mark, you're probably not running this command with sudo because you don't have the permissions to read the file to do, for example, if I can't read it, I can't SHA-1 or SHA-256 uh, checksum. Another big warning. Remember, we're running this command as root. We're running it with the sudo uh, 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 subsystem. Packages can include scripts that will run when I give it the dash V option. Ooh, that's cool. So you're running something as root. You have no idea what was in that package file to begin with. Let's run some stuff. I think this was a horrible addition. I absolutely disagree with it. I can kind of understand why they included it, but I really, really wish they didn't. Uh, this is just danger, danger, danger in my mind. If an attacker dropped a Trojan by, uh, RPM on your system for any reason and you validate it, cha-ching, nice and easy. Of course, they're going to need administrative access to begin with, but certainly just knowing that somebody might be running untrusted code on your system as root makes my skin crawl, going to be honest. But we have a defense against that. We're going to use the dash dash no scripts option, which is going to say do not run those validation scripts, period. And that's going to give us the level of protection that we need. Of course, only if we're using a trusted and validated RPM binary, because if we're using the attacker's own binary, they could just ignore that. So here's what that looks like. Hang on, sorry. One other note. I'm going to look at this one, and then I'm going to show you the previous slide. I didn't like the order that those were in. So the validation that we're going to do here, we're going to say, I want to query everything, dash V A, and I want to run no scripts, because that's a bad thing, like we just talked about. And I want to see, then, every single file belonging to every single package on that uh, subject system that I've got mounted that doesn't match one of its validation checks. And remember I told you about the SM5, uh, L, L, blah, 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 I can't remember them all now. Um, but all those characters that were in there, well, that is those first handful of columns. So in the case of right here, we can see that there's um, the S, which corresponds to uh, I'm going to cheat. Yes, size. Thank you. The size. The uh, the M would uh, would tell us if uh, the uh, I had this. I did this like 20 minutes ago, and I remembered them all. And this is horribly embarrassing, and I, I feel very silly. The mode. Yes. So the permissions on it. The five is the MD5, um, et cetera, et cetera. We can certainly go through every single one of those and explain how I can't remember what I reviewed 20 minutes ago, and that is horribly embarrassing. So we're just going to say, you remember that slide a couple ago? Yeah, yeah, that stuff. So. In this case, we see that those are all of the files on that subject system that do not match what they should in the database. In the case of querying just one, uh, we can look down at the bottom. We're querying just the postfix. Now, what's this C character mean here? So now we're going to go back to where this should have been, which is out of order. There are some files we expect to change after they're installed. Those are the configuration files, because deploying everything in its default configuration probably is a bad idea for a whole other different set of reasons. So in that case, it's still going to tell us that it's changed, but it's going to say, you don't jump out of your seat just yet. It's probably OK. It's a config file. Maybe still need to look further into that, but it's, it's something that you need to be aware of. It is tagged as a configuration file. So 
cool feature alert. By the way, if you're ever doing uh, images for slides and you look up siren in Google Images search, don't do that at work because the fan fiction that's around the Greek mythology is just really people need better hobbies. Just put it that way. So police siren, safe. Siren totally shouldn't be looked at at work. Fortunately, I work out of my house. I was like, yeah, my kids were in the room. Good. Cool feature alert. A lot of these packages, especially all the ones that are distributed through the normal uh, reputable channels, that's going to be not just Red Hat itself or CentOS itself. There's a number of other third-party uh, package repositories like the extra packages for enterprise limit, Linux called EPEL, RPM Forge, the, which is part of the old Dag Wearsman uh, repository. They're GPG signed. GPG is a good thing because it's cryptographically secure and it gives us the opportunity to validate the contents of a package before they're installed. Sweet! Oh, but yeah, the RPM database itself, nah, we don't have to do any integrity checking on that. We don't need to do any of that stuff. The RPM database itself is not trusted. It is not signed. The contents can be manipulated with any number of Berkeley database aware tools and that should scare the heck out of you. Because if I get access to the system and I'm a really crafty attacker, I'm just going to manipulate the database itself. There'll be some artifacts that I may have done that, but you should always treat that source of information and that source of evidence as suspect. So how do we use GPG package validation, package signatures, to our advantage in a forensic environment? Well, hey, not only can we validate contents from the RPM database itself, we can validate them from a package. So we were talking about this actually earlier and how we would be able to leverage this uh, uh, when you're using Red Hat Network, for example. Well, you go out to a trusted source, download the package that you want to validate on the system, download that, validate that using the uh, RPM, it's actually the uh, dash capital K, I believe, uh, that validates the GPG signature of that RPM package. You say, yay, verily, it checks out. Now I can do RPM-P against the package file. And instead of validating the database against the database, it's going to validate the file system against the package contents. What on this file system is different than the way it was distributed in this trusted known source, this binary? Very, very valuable approach. So here's an example of doing just that. I run RPM double dash root and I validate HTTPD, that should be with sudo, and it says, yeah, your config file changed, but everything else is cool, man, you're good. Apache's good to go. Carry on. Keep calm and continue running your Linux box. I don't know, I'm not good at ripping off British war slogans, so my apologies. However, I say, you know, there's, there's something wrong here. I, that, this, maybe this attack group attack group always Trojans Apache. Maybe I have some file system evidence that indicates that something is just not quite right with that package or contents of that package. All right, you know, I, I'm going to trust my instincts here. I'm going to go out, I'm going to download that, wget because I'm old, curl is for new kids, wget's the only one I use. And I do the RPM dash capital K to validate it. And what you see down at the bottom is the SHA one's okay, the DSA signature's okay, the SHA, uh, the the uh, it's two different types of our SHA one validation. The MD5 is good, and the GPG is good. So our validation passes. We're doing this on a trusted system with a trusted version of RPM that passes. And now I can just simply say, go ahead, validate against this package file. Of course, we still don't want to run any scripts. And sure enough, oh. The HTTPD binary now shows up as changed size, changed MD5. All right, we got a problem. But I was able to validate that with a very high level of certainty against a trusted binary RPM. So here's a couple of real world use cases. And I kind of had a, a, a little bit of fun uh, thinking some of these up. Some of them are, are uh, commands I used in a real case uh, that, that's, and again, inspired this, this topic, uh, inspired me to write about this topic. Others, uh, I just said, hey, what's the, the last one actually is like, what's the craziest thing I could think of? So it's, it's a little over the top, but it's, it was fun. So the first thing here is show me all the non-configuration files 
that are owned by an RPM that fail any validation check. Remember, the RPM-V is only going to print out files that fail one or more validation checks. Therefore, I want to filter out anything that's got that C in the center column there. So I've got a couple of spaces, a C and another space. It takes care of that four uh, character column in between the, uh, the check columns and the file name. And sure enough, I get this. Hey, you know what? All of these failed pretty useful because if I'm looking at a subject system and I want to just really quickly take a look at all right what what might have changed that I need to focus my efforts on you, know, you remember uh, Chad's example if you were here last night where he had that funnel uh, you know, of taking all these hundreds of thousands of files on a system and just getting the ones out that you need Well, this isn't going to get you down to one or two on a real system uh, certainly not one that's got user data on it however it's going to help and it's going to get rid of the stuff that we don't want to focus on. Another example, only show me the config files and only show me the ones that fail an MD5 checksum. And the way that I do that is with the dot command, which if you're familiar with using grep in a typical Unix environment, it matches any character, which is kind of just like let that pass through. I said show me anything that has a 5 in the third column of its output and has also the space space C space characters in there which is going to match a configuration file and sure enough I get a list of these as well and I pulled these off a live system um, you know that I have so these are, are legitimate files that you would expect to be uh, changed on, a, on a, uh, an operational box so here's the one that I kind of said hey look let's just come up with something ridiculous and crazy uh, I did not run this on a live system <laughs> you'll see why in just a minute because I don't think my customers would be very happy with me if I did that. So I created this silly script called find orphans. I want to find any file that is not owned by an RPM on the entire file system. Now, I don't know how many uh, Unix file systems you may have interacted with. There's a lot of files on there. Uh, it's going to run an RPM command for every single one of them. And, and I mean even if you've got a pretty fast system the I.O. is going to stack up. It's going to be kind of slow. Uh, it's going to take a while. But what am I getting? I'm getting a list of files that I care about. I'm getting a list of files that may be where I want to focus. And I can do some other shelf foo and grep out some things that I may know are, are uh, benign or not worth my consideration. But when I run that, I get the, the, uh, the result of, of files that are not owned by any package. Now, that was supposed to not be on the previous slide. Sorry. Um, this script here took a little while to debug and get to work. Um, I ran into actually some really, really strange errors, and I believe they are bugs in RPM, and I have not been able to track them down. In particular, this works perfectly. The concept works perfectly when you run it against a system by itself. It stops working when you run it with the dash dash root. It starts giving you some extra output that shouldn't necessarily be there. Um, in particular, it's going to say that file doesn't exist, even though it does but only for some files. And I'll be honest, I can't figure it out. I, I spent a good couple of hours trying to track that down with S-Trace and a whole bunch of other debugging utilities. I got precisely nowhere. So I said, you know what? I'm going to chalk that up as a bug. I'm going to continue trying to track that down and figure it out. But I'm going to at least acknowledge the fact that based on the observations that I've made and the testing that I've done against my known images, this is going to catch all files that are not owned by any RPM package. So sure enough, after a little while on my subject system, it ground out and it gave me the list of a couple of hundred files that had not been owned by an RPM. It was a fairly new image. So here's a cool party trick, because everything is awesome. My kids sing that just for no reason in the backseat of the car now, which is pretty cool. I'm totally okay with that. I pre-ordered the Lego movie DVD on, my, on Amazon before we left the movie. So you can tell what kind of nerd I am, and I, I'm okay with that. The query format option lets us customize the output. So the folks that are uh, have, have started working with T-Shark this week, you remember the fields output? This is the fields output, but it's for RPM. Just show me the parts I want, because I want to script this, because I want to make this relevant to me. Yeah, maybe that's a little selfish, but i got a job to do. We have over 150 tags available, and the documentation is abhorrent. There is no documentation online that I have been able to find that details what 
these tags are for the current version of RPM, and more importantly, what they all mean. Oh, yeah, this one doesn't exist anymore. Here's this other one that does, and it bewilders me. So what you've got to do is you've got to kind of take a, a go out on a limb, use the dash dash query tags. It's going to list just the tag names that are available for your version of RPM, and then you can reverse engineer that mentally into, okay, this is what I care about. This is what I need to look at. Um, it was not the most fun thing in the world, I'm going to be honest, but you, I, I do it for you. It, it's worth it. It's worth it. Now, it was, it was certainly a, a challenge to get done, and, and I won't say that it, it didn't bug me tremendously. Uh, that said, certainly understand that, that we needed to find this. So why don't we do RPM DB to timeline? What if I took my entire RPM database and converted it to a log to timeline format? and put that in body file format. Now, I may not necessarily want to put that in line with my file system body file, but having this in a consistent format lets me use all these other body file aware tools to manipulate and parse and integrate and, and handle. So sure enough, that's what this one looks like. This took a while to debug and to get to work, but it works really, really well. It's body file compliant. There are a number of date fields that we do not have available, but we use zeros as is uh, you know, uh, specified in that body file format. This will be parsable by all the other utilities that you may have. So if you ever needed to do this, I can't necessarily imagine why. That's why I call it a party trick, but not necessarily for all parties, maybe for the kind that we have here, but nonetheless, it's something that you can do, and I demonstrated that because I wanted to show the power that you can derive out of this kind of a data store. So in conclusion, RPM is pretty cool, I think. It's definitely made my life easier, and it has a lot of extremely valuable metadata that we can use to process in our forensic investigations. If you understand the shortcomings of any source of evidence to include the RPM database, we can work our way around them while still maintaining high fidelity findings. And if you like shell scripting, which I think everyone should, because I'll say it again, if it doesn't happen at a command line, it doesn't need to happen, we certainly have the ability to minimize data to something that matters to us. And because I really wanted to learn how to embed an animated GIF into a keynote presentation, I found this just for everybody here. Drop the mic, walk off the stage. Rob didn't have a mic for me to drop yesterday, or else I would have done that. So that's the presentation that I've got. I hope that you found it useful or at least marginally entertaining between you and the bar, hopefully. Uh, if you've got any questions on this, certainly be happy to answer them, but, uh, but it's something that I kind of had fun putting together, and, uh, and hopefully it's, it's useful to you. I will work to get this, the slides as well as the uh, commands themselves posted. Um, I'll probably put the slides on SlideShare tomorrow. And then, uh, and then I'll pull out the commands themselves and put them into something that's a little easier to copy and paste from. Uh, so that'll be posted up. I'll commit to doing it tomorrow. I promise. How's that? Uh, hope to see you around at the, the rest of this event at DeeperCon. Glad that you made it to the inaugural event. And uh, you know, I'll be at uh, pretty much every SANS event this year, so feel free to uh, stop by and tell me that RPM talk was ridiculous and whatever it might be. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time.